everyone. I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. I had so much fun in my conversation for this episode with Brian Moore. He is the co-founder of a really cool company called Anthem, and you're going to learn more about it in our conversation. But it really stems from his career really being a learning-based journey with an intense focus on people, purpose, values, culture, and leadership while advocating that capitalism can be a powerful force for good. Brian has an amazing career from P.F. Chang's to Y Scouts, Conscious Capitalism, Arizona, and you're going to learn more about his latest venture, Anthem, and how it's bringing people together and fostering authentic human connections in a different way. Brian is on the National Board of Directors of Conscious Capitalism, Inc. He is a board member and president emeritus of the Arizona chapter of Conscious Capitalism, a member of the board of directors of the Better Business Bureau of the Pacific Southwest, and he's a member of the advisory board of the Crumb Foundation and co-author of a really wonderful book called Hiring on Purpose. And we talk about so many wonderful things, but really talking about this idea of human connection and how since the dawn of time, we are hardwired as a species for it. And how do we really create meaningful connections with others when our world is disruptive, where technology fatigue is becoming a very real experience for so many, how we can leverage the power of music and other common shared experiences as an entry point to foster that connection. We also talk about the inner work that we need to do in order to be able to show up authentically and how to be in connection and grow in this world and be able to thrive in this disruptive environment. We talk about imposter syndrome and how common that experience is and really our own journeys of getting out of our own way and our stories that keep us safe and small. I think you're going to get a lot of nuggets. It was so fun. If nothing else, it'll add a bright spot to your day and happy listening and go check out Anthem. Well, Brian, thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to connect and I'm super excited about the conversation we're going to have today, just about human connection and how we can have more of it and just everything you're up to. I am excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. So for the benefits of uh, the listeners, we, this is like a theme with my podcast, at least the, the first many, many guests is met each other through conscious capitalism, but we just did a really cool thing with you that I'm telling everyone you need to go check it out, but um, that you're doing with Anthem about creating these moments that you, you know, in your memory bank, right. That you go back and then tell stories and having people connect through them different than your, your typical team building or just ways to foster meaningful connections around something simple. And I will tell you, some people are music people. Some people aren't you, uh, use music for your first kind of inaugural launch. And I just thought it was so much fun because I am like, I live and die by music. And it was interesting to have like the memory hooks or memory triggers and whatnot. So everything you do is around human connection. So before we talk specifically about what you're doing at Anthem and people can learn more and stuff about it. Um, I just want to start with what you see as the importance of human connection in our ever increasing digital world. Well, I mean, that is a big topic. So thank you for teeing it up. Uh, You know, I, I think it's safe to say that as human beings, we are wired to connect and that dates back to the dawn of human history. So it is just part of who we are. It's, it's in our DNA And given just the sheer number of hours and weeks and months and years that we all spend at work as adults uh, with a group of people who uh, presumably are showing up to pursue a common purpose, a common mission to help our organization succeed, you know, to kind of go through that experience without taking advantage of building meaningful relationships with our colleagues seems to me to be one of the biggest opportunities that we have. And I think we're just in a time and a place and, you know, 2020 being what it, what it has been has really sort of opened this door that, you know, we're starting to see our colleagues in a much more human way. And I think we're starting to kind of get that glimpse behind the box on the org chart that they fill uh, and seeing them likely because of the unintentional invitation we've had into all of our colleagues' homes for those of us that have been connecting through video platforms as a result of the pandemic. And I think it's a really cool thing. And, I, and you know, the great part about it is there's just a rich uh, wealth of data around 
how valuable relationships are in the workplace. And so there's phenomenal business outcomes for it. it, not to mention all the human benefits that come from it, but it's a really, really good thing. And we're just excited to be, uh, to be part of, of that puzzle. I, I love that. And what's so interesting is you're right about the human connection, human relationships. And it reminds me that a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, there was a video that went viral and it was, I don't know if it was a news person or a contributor and, you know, his daughter runs in the background or his kid runs in the background. And it was like, oh, isn't that funny? And now it's like, you have pets and you have kids and you've got messy backgrounds and people are doing virtual backgrounds and in their pajama bottoms. Right. So I, I love that aspect of humanity. And I'm curious about something else because you're right. We are getting glimpses into people's lives in a way we haven't before. And I'm also hearing a lot about feeling more disconnected because we can't rely on, for those of us who are not going into a workplace, can't rely on those incidental run-ins, the, the cube side chat or the break room chat. And that in some ways teams are becoming more fragmented or more disconnected or even like friendships and whatnot. You hear about Zoom fatigue and people are like, I don't want to do one more happy hour because I'm on meetings all day. So can you just speak a little bit about kind of the flip side of that too, of how how do we find that authentic connectedness in this world where we have to work at it harder and people are having that fatigue of technology, if you will. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the technology fatigue thing is clearly real. And I think people are, are getting a little tired staring at their screens. And, you know, I don't know that I've got a perfect answer for that side. I think, you know, again, just given the circumstances, I think all of us are managing through right now, um, you know, we are going to continue to connect and use technology as a medium to do that. That being said, I think the way in which teams and leaders of teams can intentionally design time to sort of set aside the work and actually really come together and just focus on one another, I think is something that every team can do. And and my big question is, if teams are integrating a very intentional connection opportunities is the same Zoom fatigue or Teams fatigue, whatever platform, video technology platform they're using, does that start to go away because you're, you're, you're no longer sort of focused on, oh, I'm working and it makes it a little bit more difficult because I'm working through technology. Um, I, I don't know. My hope is, is that, you know, for the teams that really make that effort to connect and set aside the work and really just focus on one another and be there for each other, my hope is, is that the, the Zoom fatigue or the Teams fatigue is, is not nearly as big a challenge as it might be given, you know, how much time we are spending on these platforms. So far, our experience has been good and it's been a nice break um, from, you know, from, from, from the normal day to day. So I think that that is a big question that is still yet to be answered. And frankly, I think we're going to sort of fall back into some sort of a, I hope, happy medium or middle place, I should say, where... You know, we are going to go back to the office at some point. I just don't know that every team's going to go back Monday through Friday. I think, you know, likely my crystal ball being fuzzy as anybody else's is we're going to go back to some sort of a hybrid approach where, you know, there's certainly going to be more time at home than there ever was or, or remote and then some number of days in the office. But I, hopefully those days will be much more collaboration days than they will be individual work days. Yeah. You know, it makes me wonder, I I think you're right. And every workplace is certainly different, but I know that for those positions and those types of businesses and industries that have the option for people to work remote, I think that the pandemic certainly has brought to light where that's possible, where people just weren't doing it before because for a variety of reasons, but realizing, well, it was necessary and it, it actually works. Okay. But what, what I finding is that it, requires, if you're going to have that authentic human connection, it's really about setting that intention to be fully present and whether or not you're on zoom or phone calls even harder, because it's easier to check out because people can't see what you're doing. But I would say that even goes to in person. How often do we have meetings that aren't effective or we're not fully present in interactions? And I don't know, it just made me think of all of a sudden uh, in an earlier episode, I interviewed Kristen Hadid and she was talking about not being fully present in a Zoom type of meeting with somebody and then literally finding out the next day that that person died of a heart attack and feeling like, oh my gosh, this is the last interaction that this person had and I wasn't giving him the gift of my full presence, right? And so I think that 
I don't know. So everything you're saying, I'm like, yeah. And it makes me think of whether or not we're going to have intentional times where we're going to collaborate or we're going to create that space in person or do it virtually. For me, as I think about human connection, it's really coming back to the intentionality we are bringing as we show up into interactions and being real about our boundaries. Like you can't go from, I don't care. I don't care if it's in person or if it's at home and virtual, you can't go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting and have no space in between to breathe, to go to the bathroom, to get your thoughts together, to reflect. So I think even just being mindful of how we schedule our days. And then when we show up, the intention we're showing up with. So I know there's my little soapbox, but that just made me think of that. No, I I mean, I I agree with all of it. And, you know, as you were sharing that, it it, had occurred to me, um, I thought about this before, but it came up again is, I wonder if the Zoom fatigue part of, if not the largest contributor, is it's really hard to sort of multitask or not be present when you're on video because it's like you've got this camera on you and you know the other person's looking at you. And if you start getting distracted, um, it, it almost feels so much more singularly focused when you're in a conference room and you're in person with your teammates yeah, you could check your phone, you can sort of daydream, whatever. And it feels like you almost have some level of camouflage maybe where you're not the only one there, but when you're in a Zoom, I don't know, it's just different. And so maybe for the first time, at least in the work environment, all of us are getting a much, it's almost like a crash course into what it's like and how hard it really is to be fully present and like paying attention to the other person or individuals that you're with. And perhaps that's the largest contributor to this Zoom fatigue is we're actually learning how to be in the moment. And I'm not saying that people aren't getting distracted, but by and large, I don't know, it seems to be easier to detect if somebody's spacing out or multitasking when you're on Zoom versus in person or, or, or we have less of a tolerance. I don't know. It's, it's a really interesting topic. Yeah. For sure. Well, you know, one one thing that you know, and this is get, getting into what you're doing with Anthem and the, and how we create human connection, right, through technology, because I think it's a really interesting concept. And I was thinking about pre-COVID, our business we largely relied on Zoom because we have people all over the country, and so for me it was like, oh yeah, we do Zoom all the time, and and I feel like we make authentic connections with the people that we train in our training programs, the people that we consult with, and particularly the people who go through our, our professional training programs. I know in the fall of 2018, we hosted our inaugural Fusion 2.0 conference. And that was the first time that I had actually met many of these people in person. And you're yeah. like, oh, you're taller than I thought, or you're shorter <laughs> than I thought, or, you know, um, and, but you feel like you know them. And so I know that you can, you know, create uh, those human experiences. And so it does make me wonder of, you know, the intentionality, the the space you're setting aside, how you're showing up, the multitasking or not, but I feel like I have made some really good friends and, and relationships through zoom. And some of them I have yet to meet in person and some, you know, I've only met in person once, but that relationship was already there. And I think that, you know, if you've met them in person and then you go to zoom, that certainly helps too. But I think if we're, if we're just showing up, like we do for conference calls, you know, can you hear me now? And people are trying to just, this is a check the box versus, so, I mean, we could get into a whole topic of what meetings are necessary and are we just meeting for the sake of meeting and can we be more respectful of people's time and all that type of stuff. But I do want to talk about, so I think about it with technology and people maybe being sick of it in some regards. On the other hand, it's not going away and our world keeps advancing with technology. You've chosen to use technology as a platform to foster uh, these uh, human connections on a, on a different level. And what I find so interesting about what you're doing is that we obviously just did it recently with our graduate community that we call our paradigm pioneers. And I feel like you, you feel like you know them, but what I realize is that when we get together, we're talking about our common passion and vision, right? For having more human workplaces and for ushering a new paradigm and supporting one another with the work that we do. But I realize a lot of us don't actually know each other as people. And so it was really interesting to think about, you know, moments in your life and then engage in storytelling to connect with people on a different level. So can you talk to me about kind of how Anthem came to be and how it fits into everything we're talking about? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll try and be as brief as I can. Uh, it was a little over three years ago, I joined an entrepreneurs organization forum, which is essentially a peer-to-peer forum made up of primarily entrepreneurs and founders 
who use this forum experience uh, as a life board of advisors for both personal and professional growth. And being the new member when I joined, and this happens for every new member, at least for this particular forum that I joined, everyone goes through what's called a lifeline process. And essentially what it is, is you reflecting on the entirety of your life's journey, condensing that into about an hour long presentation that you give to the forum members to give them the best shot to get to know me as the new member as quickly as possible. And as I went through that, I was just really awestruck at how quickly I was able to be very vulnerable, establish immediate connection and a sense of vulnerability-based trust with this essentially group of strangers. Of course, the context is, is that, you know, they're there to be there for me and likewise me for them. So there's an incentive to be a bit more, uh, I guess, risk loving in the stories that you choose to tell. Uh, And I'm a deep end of the pool kind of guy anyway. So I just jump in like, what the hell, let's do this. And having gone through it, it was just really, really powerful. And so one of the individuals who had already been in that forum about a year before me, over the past few years, we got to talking about how powerful that experience was for both of us independently, and then started thinking about how much value can be created for teams if they were able to experience something similar, right? You show up to work with the same people every day and you're going through the motions and you're spending all this time together. And yet to the point you just made, do you really know them? You might know them for the box on the org chart that they fill and you've got this level of competency-based trust that you know they can deliver based on the job that they do. But it's like, huh, do I really know Jennifer? Do I really know Rosie? Do I really know Jim? Uh, And And, you know, what could be gained from going through that experience and really getting to know them? So the idea was, could we bring the lifeline experience to a corporate environment for the purpose of accelerating performance? Because all of the data, and we can go through it, uh, shows that if you can build, in addition to competency-based trust, that sense of vulnerability-based trust, it's an amazing accelerator of performance. And so that's, that's where the idea stemmed from. And then from there... Uh, you know, we, we wanted to use life moments as sort of this, the, the, the foundation, the basis for the experience. Not everybody is an amazing storyteller, but if you simply ask people to start revealing particular experiences or moments from their life that have been very impactful for them, whether it's a highlight, a low light, or even a nuanced moment that may have only meant something to them, And if you ask them to begin to catalog and think about those experiences, it's pretty easy for people to to remember and recall those types of experiences. And so layering music in as a, an additional connection bridge was, uh, or has been sort of this initial module for us to make it even more fun and a bit more safe for people to express moments and stories by connecting those moments and stories to a song that was essentially the soundtrack of that moment or story at that time in their life. And what we have found through this experience of people cataloging, reflecting on and cataloging moments and stories from their life and then connecting them to a song is you create all these different types of opportunities for people to say, oh my God, I didn't know that about you. I went through something like that. Or, oh my God, you like that song? I used to listen to that 10 years ago. And so all these really interesting human connection moments are starting to emerge because you're allowing people to reveal something about their life that matters to them and this additional shared universal language that music is for so many of us to create these connection opportunities. And we're pretty bullish on where this can go. So uh, probably a bit longer than, uh, than what you were hoping for in an answer, but that's how the idea came to be. No, that's not, it's not too long. And you know, it made me think of is it's almost like the ultimate icebreaker. And when you were describing kind of that, you know, the shared, shared experience around music, because it's fairly safe and benign. If you're trying to build vulnerability-based trust, right? Again, some people, music's not a big thing. It's not like for my husband, he wouldn't be able to do it. He literally, it, like we're the opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> I live and die by music and he could care less. But anyway, sure. but yep. But, um, and there was a few people who were like, well, I don't, music's not my thing. So they had a hard time with it, but overall, right. Most people can appreciate music. Totally. And, 
And what was interesting is this is a couple of years ago, one of our clients that we write about in our book, and we started doing all this purpose and all this why work with them. And every time we would get together, we would try to come up with just a different type of icebreaker of, Hey, just before we dive into this work together, just something right to bring that humanness and get to know your table mates. And in some cases, people didn't know each other because they were from different locations. And the very first one we did to kick this off and mind you, this is, we did many of these with the entire company was we asked them to talk about um, either or, or both their first concert experience yep. and or their first car. And people had just the most incredible stories, right? And sometimes they, they melded them both together. And it was just awesome to watch the energy in the room and light up and people like connect over a song or, oh my gosh, do you like that band or that? Or, oh yeah, I love that car too. Or, um, and so I can totally, totally get that when you give people something common to look at, it becomes easier to share about yourself, even for people who are shy or introverted. And you start to see them more as a human, like to your point versus just, you have this function to do, or you're just this idea that I um, have about you or what, or, or whatnot. Um, and I don't know. And I, I'm curious about your algorithm and stuff, but for the benefits of the listener, you basically, you go in, right. And you talk about creating your five moment intro. So you can either like pick the songs to search for. If you have an idea of, Ooh, this memory is in mind, right. You can go look for it. Or you could, I think for mine, it was like, what genres. So I said, reggaeton, eighties, pop rock. Like I picked a variety of them, right. To see what would pop up. And, and it'll just say, does this resonate for you? Does it resonate for you? And I was surprised that some of the, I think I searched for one song, but some of the songs that just randomly popped up, I was like, it, a memory popped in my head. And then I had to decide, is that one that is significant or not, or do I want to share or not? But it was, it was like, I probably could have done that for hours. Cause I w- it just brought me back to like a moment in time or it, it was so fascinating. Um, so that, that is the cool thing about music, right? Is it, it and I totally, there, there are some people where music just does not play a super integral part in their life. Fortunately, we've not met anyone yet that hates music. It may be less important, but there's no, uh, uh, um, there's no music haters. Um, but to your point, music's a time machine, or at least it has time machine like capabilities. And when I hear a song that that triggers a memory, I am right back to that time and place in my life. It 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 wakes up all of my senses, and it's really really magical in that way. And that's why we wanted to use music as our 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 opening module, if you will, knowing that we we're going to layer on additional experiences so that folks like your husband who might. Uh, be able to much more easily associate memories and moments to, you know, a family tradition when they were a kid or a movie that they watched or a book that they read or a TED talk that just totally rocked their world or a travel experience. You know, there's all these different moments in our lives that we can easily connect to things other than music or in addition to music that are very revealing and can help people begin to communicate, you know, the life that they've led and just again, build, at least create a bridge and an opportunity to build better connections with the the people, our colleagues that we spend so much time with. Yeah. Well, I love that. And you know what it makes me think of is, you know, not right. Not everyone listening to this is going to have the, um, the budget or to bring in Anthem necessarily to do this, although it's super cool, but it makes me think about, you know, whether you're sitting at home with some friends or neighbors or your family member, or you're at work, you know, you, you think about kind of the, I call it the icebreaker on steroids type of thing. But, but if you do like, just pick a topic or pick something and ask people to, you know, be vulnerable and, and share a, a memory or an experience related to that. I mean, that's basically the idea. You've just formalized it in a platform. And I think that, you know, sometimes we just have the same old conversations or we talk about the same old things. And I know I find myself talking to people saying, you know, do you really know like what the hopes and dreams are of that person? Or do you know what that person's favorite song is? Or do you know why that person, you know, hates that movie or loves that movie? And we start to realize that there's so much more to people, like even people who we think we know really well, there's an opening to be able to know people at a, at a deeper level, again, through something simple, because it feels safer to share around your movie experience or, uh, or a book or a whatever, pick the topic and, and let people share. And sometimes they're funny stories and sometimes they're sad and sometimes they're, you know, everything in between, but it's just getting to know people at a slightly different level by just creating a safe space to do it. That's, that's exactly it. And, and again, I think the benefits that come from that, particularly for teams 
has just been proven over and over and over again. And then there's all the just benefits to each of us as human beings. I mean, again, we're in such a weird time right now in human history where our our wiring to connect has been disrupted for a period of time, hopefully temporary, and certainly seems to be that way. And so how do we begin to fill that void? Um, And I think if anything, this last year has shown many of us, uh, and dare I say all of us, that you know, some of the things that we took for granted, like shaking hands and giving hugs and just being able to, you know, sit down for coffee or sit in a conference room with more than 10 people, not socially distanced, is, those are really cool things and we miss them. And so uh, I think, you know, oftentimes we have to lose something to recognize how special it is. And I'm hoping that that is one of the biggest silver linings that comes from this, this horrible, you know, experience that uh, the pandemic has exacted on all of us that that comes from this. That just brought me to a line. I think it's a Cinderella song. Don't know what you got till it's gone with a really right? bad raspy Amy <laughs> there, man. But there we go. I love it. I, I, you know what? Uh, that video just popped in my head, too. As soon as you said it. Oh, my God. We can start talking about Motley Crue and rat oh, and poison. Yeah. And I, Cinderella. I was, I was a hair band junkie. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I still I still uh I still love me some John Bon Jovi, even though he doesn't have uh, the long hair anymore. In fact, I joke that he's my boyfriend. So even though he that's all, you know what, if you don't love Bon Jovi, that, yeah, come on, everybody's yeah, got to yeah. love something about uh, Bon Jovi. My yeah, goodness, right? <laughs> love it. I love it. Well, so I, I, what I, one other thing I love. There's so many things I love about everything you do, Brian. But it's interesting because like you've had a really eclectic background, which we will have already talked about in the intro and I know you're part of Y Scouts and wrote the book Hiring on Purpose or co-authored it and we feature Y Scouts in our book as well and really looking at purposeful hiring and now you're you're extremely active in conscious capitalism obviously finding amp I mean what what I observe about you right is you see a need to bring greater connection greater humanity and 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 you just you do it right and for us like that's showing up as a leader is hey I see a need I see an opportunity I see an opportunity to make a difference and I'm going to figure out how to do it. And it's not a solo journey, right? You're, you're doing it with other people and you're getting help and mentor and support. And so I love all of that. And I'm curious with your background and what you're seeing out in the world, what do you see? I mean, again, you don't have a crystal ball. You said it's cloudy. None of us do, but I'm just curious where you see the future of work kind of evolving and, and going at this point. Uh, I mean, wow. Uh, do you want to talk more about the workplace itself? Is it our use of technology? Is there any particular sort of focal point with that question or just leave no, it open-ended? Open-ended, wherever you want to take it. I mean, I think we continue to lean into leveraging technology in a huge, huge way. I don't think there's any genius in that statement. I think we really are on the forefront of each of us as individuals beginning to really tap into all of what have, have been, uh, I think, notorious, notoriously referred to as the soft skills, which frankly, I think are the hardest to develop. And so if technology, which we continue to lean into, starts to replace and do more of the routine tasks that were once done by human beings, that then frees us up with all the time we used to spend on some of these routine things to tap into what actually separates us from machines, which is that notion of those soft skills, our humanity, our empathy, our curiosity, our compassion, our active listening, all all of those skills. And my hope is, is that the future of work is one that human beings actually get to now really develop and bring to light all of those things that are what make us human. And as technology continues to replace, you know, the stuff that makes us feel like robots goes to the robots and we can actually now like do the knowledge creativity work that frankly i think we're uh, ideally wired to do so you know the knowledge economy or this in, this fourth industrial revolution which has been in motion for you know quite some time now i think just continues to steamroll forward and my hope is is that people really start to come alive and and organizations tap into that creative brilliance that we all have and imagination becomes more central to all of our jobs and solving problems in new ways and using technology to make things more efficient. Uh, But, you know, I think we all get to be more human in this next phase of what the workplace looks like. That's my hope at least. 
I think it's a great hope. And at the same time, what it makes me think about, we wrote about this in the start of our book, like the changing era and, you know, all of these predictions for like the jobless future because machines and AI and whatnot are taking over some of those mundane tasks. But to your point, it's that, that it, in theory, in hopefulness, frees up humans to do what only humans can do. It, it is, to the, I mean, who creates the machines, who, right, to innovate, to create, to solve problems. And at the same time, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but there's this predicament because when people have been stifled or they haven't had that vulnerability-based trust or that psychologically safe environment, as Brene Brown would say, we're showing up armored all over the place. And so you can't have that creativity, that uh, that innovation, that working together, you can't have those soft skills, which again, they need to stop calling them soft skills, but we know that emotional intelligence and communication and self-awareness are so key. But if people are not being taught how to enter into that inner work, which is, you know, everything we do, it's like the inner game runs the outer game. If we don't help people tend to that inner work and know what to do with themselves and how to show up to be in connection we're going to be in a whole host of trouble. So it's interesting because I see there's so much opportunity like you and it's, if we don't help people grow and evolve to navigate and thrive in that environment where maybe they've gotten by being safe and small and in, you know, protected armored mode or didn't have to communicate or whatnot, or we, we turned the other cheek because, oh, this person's good technologically at that, even though they're a poor communicator, I think that stuff's going to catch up with us. I would think so. And, and, you know, it's it, your comment around Brene's work and all of the amazing bright light that she has shown on, on all of this soft skill stuff. You know, if we're constantly living uh, in the amygdala hijack mode of fight, flight, freeze, my goodness. I mean, what a paralyzing uh, mode to be in at work where our companies are looking for all of us to bring our highest level of contribution every day. But if we're constantly in a, uh, in a fear, fear mode, flight, fight, freeze mode, and not able to tap into our prefrontal cortex and unleash the creativity and imagination that we have, well, it's no wonder disengagement is what it is. And people are constantly quitting because their boss is a jerk and you know, we're all sort of like operating in, in the amygdala hijack mode way more often than we should be. And that's the, that's the opportunity. You talk, the future of work is, do we really start to lower these defense systems, lean in, uh, be more vulnerable? Uh, I'm not saying throw the rules of decorum out the window. I mean, we still need to operate as professionals. We're showing up to accomplish important work to serve our stakeholder communities, Um, So there's certainly a way of being, but we don't have to like check our real or half of who we are as human beings at the door when we come to work, whether it's coming to the desk in our house or the desk in our office, like, let's just show up and you be Rosie and I be Brian. And, you know, it might get a little messy here or there, but that's life. Like what isn't, it's all messy. This whole thing, nobody knows what the hell's going on anyways. Mike, we're all figuring this stuff out as we go. Right. Well, you know what it makes me. Let's figure it out together. Exactly. Well, you know what it makes me when you were saying like, you know, leaving part of ourselves, this was 20 plus years ago now. And I don't remember the exact saying, and I honestly don't remember who said it, but it's, it's something along the lines of, you know, that when we come to work, we need to leave our car windows cracked so that our real self can breathe while we're at work. Right. And like, you know, we're (laughs) because like, we can't, we, you know, we can't show up with, we're supposed to somehow be this robot or be this person who doesn't have a personal life or feelings or scare, you know, fears or anxieties or, you know, whatever that is. And What's so interesting, you talk about the amygdala hijack. I was literally being interviewed on someone else's podcast this morning, and we were just talking about how, I don't know about you, but in 2020, I have seen that amygdala hijack and that self-protection and that armor take over left and right. And the people who've done a lot of inner work catch it or when are willing to hear it when you hold up a mirror and reflect it to them that that's what's happening. But there's so many people that don't have that. And so I don't know, like, I think when you see the increased divisiveness that's happening in our country and just where people are struggling. I think it's, you know, whether it's known or unknown, it is that it is that common condition or common experience of being human where we do have that amygdala hijack. We do immediately 
reach for self-protection mode, but it's, are we aware it's happening? Can we catch ourselves earlier when it happens, right? Do we have trusted people in our lives that can hold up a mirror or, you know, illuminate those blind spots for us in a spirit of caring to go, Hey, um, because without that, I think we're, we're going to be in a whole host of, of trouble. And I think that 2020 really showed where it's just happening left and right. So yeah, I'm, the, 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 the downside, the shadowy side of the echo chambers that exist based upon, you know, where people might be absorbing their news. Um, it, it's there, there's so much positive to it. And we also see the shadow side of it. And, you know, if, if, <laughs> if what you're consuming of what each of us is consuming is keeping us in a fight flight freeze mode and there's nobody in that echo chamber to sort of like just time out let's 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 step back for a minute and just ask a few questions i don't care which side of the issues you're on if if we continue to operate in these closed uh silos we're 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 in big trouble um anyways yeah Yeah. it's 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 unfortunate it is. Well, that's why I like during, I don't really watch the news anyway, because I feel like it's all negative and they should report on the good things in life. Cause all it is, is they, they only report on the bad things that are happening in the world. And I'm like, there's a lot of good that happens too. So I, I love, I loved when the pandemic hit, um, what was it? John, uh, what's his face? The some good news channel. Yeah, yeah, oh my God. Yeah. That just became like my favorite thing. I'm like, see this, if there was, I would watch that. I don't want to watch like people fighting and how many people died and how many political people are fighting today. And anyway, but so that's an aside. So this is a good transition then to some question that I ask all of my guests, because the whole premise of this podcast is that every single one of us has an opportunity to show up as a leader in our life and make a positive difference and trying to normalize the human experience that in doing so, when we're asking people to put yourself out there to show up as a leader, that it, there's a risk to it. And, you know, you're being vulnerable and guess what? even if we do work, even if, even if you don't mind jumping in the deep end of the pool, as you said, we all, to some degree, tell ourselves stories that keep us safe and small. We all, you know, have our amygdala hijack and our armor get the best of us. And so one of the things I try to do in this podcast, is when people feel like maybe they're alone, that this reminds them, no, you're not, (laughs) because guess what? We, we all do it right. Here's someone who's successful and they do it too. So that gets me to, to the question of what is a self-limiting story that you tell yourself and how do you move beyond it when it shows up so that you can still show up as a leader? Yeah. My, mine all revolves around, I guess, what's commonly referred to as imposter syndrome that despite having spent the last now 21 years in this work um, of people and culture and values and purpose and hiring and talent development and organizational development that, I'm like, who am I to uh, preach any sort of message? Like I'm, I'm, I'm no thought leader. Um, There's always somebody out there who knows more than me. And I allow that to get in my way. And if I, I shouldn't say if, when I just lean into what I care most about, uh, I've been told that um, I'm able to, uh, provide some dose of enthusiasm and inspiration for people to, you know, to, 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 to live a better life, to grow, to lean into their best, uh, of what they're capable of. And yet still to this day, uh, you know, there's that quiet, well, it's not quiet, the loud little voice in my head. That's like, Brian, who the hell do you think you are? Like you, (laughs) you, you don't deserve to be doing this. And you know, that voice, uh, little yeah. bastard. It's oh, it always, sucks. Always. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks, yeah. but it's there and it's, it's a constant work in progress. Yeah. Well, yeah. and you're so not alone. I mean, I definitely have that voice. And I think, you know, that for me, that piggybacks with it's either that who the hell do you think you are, or it's, this isn't good enough. Right. And I think Brene calls them like those voices of shame, but it's the, oh, this isn't good enough yet to put out there or what are people, you know, going to think of it. And then you're like, whatever. Right. So it's a, it's a constant, like 
it's a constant battle, but I will tell you, you know, that I don't care if I'm coaching a CEO or a world renowned surgeon or whatever, that imposter syndrome is so real. And I, and I feel like going back to the 2020 is kind of elevated that amygdala hijack because none of us have lived through a pandemic before or trying to navigate, you know, homeschooling. I mean, there's just, there's so many who've never been here before in 2020 that as people are trying to fake it and make it, I feel like that imposter syndrome has like grown and, and like, unfortunately gotten momentum because there is so much that we are just making up as we go. And I think it just fuels that, oh, like somehow we should know better. We should have our act together more or but then you go, well, nobody does. Like, what the hell? But anyway. well, I, think, I think a contributor to it too is, you know, because every, well, everyone who wants to have a voice has a platform, whether it's any one of the social media sites out there, you know, we hear from so many more people that are stepping into a position on something or positioning themselves as a thought leader or an expert. And so, we are, I am constantly bombarded by, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people. And I'm like, oh, well, they they must be the expert on that. And so in a way it's like everyone can be seen now as an expert or a thought leader on whatever topic they might be speaking on. And it's like, oh, well, I, I guess I really don't know nearly as much as I thought I did, or my 20 some odd years of experience, eh, that's not enough yet. And so it um, it kind of feeds into that self-fulfilling yeah. imposter syndrome uh, prophecy, which is uh, rather annoying, actually. Yeah. yeah. It's so annoying. <laughs> so annoying. So annoying. And I suck, suck at self-promotion. I'm terrible at it. Yeah. Um, it feels so unnatural. Um, and so that's part of my problem as well. I, I will tell you, I abhor it. Like it is taking me years to get a podcast out there and like blogs are safe forever. But even like when the pandemic first hit and our book launched, and so we were doing a virtual book club and I did some videos that I posted on LinkedIn and I abhorred doing it. It was just more of like, I felt like I needed to say something and now I haven't done one in months and people are like, where are your videos? I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, it's this just like, what? like, can you just quietly find out about me? Like, and then whenever I have to post when there's like, like, I love posting, here's an episode, go, you know, see my guests or whatever. But you know, it's part of, oh, I have a blog out or this or that. And I, I have a cringe and a pit in my stomach every time I do anything to promote anything I'm doing. Cause I just, I don't know what it is. So I'm, I, I feel your pain. I'm, yeah, right, it's, here. I'm it, right here it, with you. It sucks. It is what it is, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And then there's know. some people that, you know what I think it is, is that I think it's that narrative of, I see some people that to me, it just feels like all they do is self-promote, but there's some people that are out there that it feels authentic and it's not a big deal. And there's some people that for whatever reason, like it doesn't feel authentic probably because it's not, but I think that I have this fear of, well, that's what people are going to think that I'm that inauthentic me monster. Look at me. And it just feels gross. And yep. I don't know. So anyway, but yep. Yep. Anyway. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like, uh, I want the work to be discovered on its own and to have legs of its own, regardless of who the messenger might be. Yeah. 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 Yep. 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 Okay. Well, so then assuming that you're not getting stuck in the imposter syndrome, right? Or you're moving beyond that. uh, What is an impactful way that you are showing up as a leader in your life? And I would say both professionally and personally these days. So, uh, I I mean, I, I will start with what is my greatest responsibility and that is to my two teenage daughters and to my wife. And you know, modeling for them the best that I can, uh, this startup life and bringing something to the world that, you know, myself and my co-founder created out of nothing. You know, we didn't, we didn't, uh, copy somebody else's idea. We had one and here we are starting it. And I get razzed by both my daughters a lot. Um, they love to compare, uh, you know, my quote unquote paycheck uh, to my wife's and, uh, <laughs> they, they like to haze me a lot, uh, yet, uh, you know, wake up every day and, and, and plugging away. So that is for me, I think the, the biggest thing is, is modeling, uh, you know, what I'm up to for both my daughters and for my wife, um, which is, it's, it means a lot to me, uh, on the professional side, you know, continuing to lean in, you know, your comment around um, bringing something to the world that you know isn't perfect, but you want it to be perfect and allowing that perfection to be the enemy of progress. 
is these Anthem experiences, which, you know, thanks for giving me the opportunity to do it with your Paradigm Pioneer group. It was awesome. And as I finished it up, I'm like, oh, I would, I wanted to do this different and this different and this different. And so, you know, I want to just stop and pause the whole business until I can get the experience to be perfect. But then it's like, I know that that's not a reality. It's never going to be perfect. I might be able to get it to 85 or 90% phenomenal. And so just constantly leaning into something that I know isn't where I want it to be yet and being okay with that being okay. Um, And so that is, uh, that's really hard for me. So hard. Um, Because I just want people to walk away from it going, oh my God, that was amazing. And I know some people have that and some don't. And I don't want anyone to walk away not feeling it. And until I get there, it's just going to keep driving me to to, want to perfect it. Well, and I think if I could offer anything up, it's I think we're similar in that instead of thinking it's like perfecting it, it's the, it's the strive for excellence. Right. And how can it be better? Cause I I'm like you, I mean, I think back to like early versions of our website and they were just static and crappy and even early versions of like the portals we had for our learners and, and even early versions of our workbooks that there was, they weren't pretty. We didn't have a graphic designer do them. It was just, it's like, I'm like, it's substance. It's not sizzle. And I think over time, right. You refine. Okay. Now we're going to redo this part of our website. And now we're going to add this. And I, and I, and we're always like an evolution in progress. Like, okay, now we need updates here. Oh, this is annoying. This has been static. And I think that hey, we can drive ourselves crazy. And one of the things that is has always helped me and it must come from like marketing or I don't know, technology or something, which is not my space, but it was, you know, what's the MVP, the minimum viable product to get this out there. And whether it's school curriculum, right. Whether it's, I don't know, hobby you're doing in your house. I mean, I think about like, that is just like, okay, like, will this get the job done? And you're opening yourself up for feedback not as a criticism, but how can this be better? And I think when you put yourself in that space of service to others, right? It doesn't, then it takes away that pressure of perfection and say, we know we have something of value to offer. And I only know what I know. And I'm going to rely on feedback from people to tell me what is working and what, where it fell short and look at those, although it might sting though, where did it fall short as an opportunity to go? That's going to guide our next improvement. Yep. hundred percent, hundred percent. Love that. Yeah. So now we have kind of our quick question slash rapid fire. Uh, are you are you ready to play? I don't know. I'm nervous. You're going to dive in the deep end of the pool? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So they start out uh, a little more thoughtful and then they get more fun and silly. So. All right. Okay. First one, Brian, fill in the blank. Living authentically is. Being true to myself. Absolutely. When the world is presenting an opening, but you don't feel like showing up as a leader, what do you do? Send my wife in. <laughs> for reinforcement. <laughs> um, I love that so much. That's awesome. <laughs> I jumped right to the silly. Uh, it's when the fine. World, when the world is presenting an opportunity and I don't feel like showing up as a leader. Right. What do I do? I, I think about the core values that I have chosen to live my life by and bounce the opportunity off of that and then ask, what, what, what do I say I am and live by? And is choosing not to show up in alignment or not? And if not, it's time to get in there and put my you know, big boy, big girl pants on and, and lean in. And your wife's in front of you as a shield while you figure it out, right? (laughs) I love it. (laughs) All right. When's the last time you were courageous and how did you show up? Uh, The last time I was courageous, I would say was with the Paradigm Pioneer Group. And that was the first Anthem experience that I had delivered to a non- team, if you will. I'm not saying that you guys don't operate as a team, but I would really look at you more as a a community. Yeah. Yeah, You're a community of of professionals, but that, that community, you don't all work together on the same project Monday through Friday. And so that was, I was, I was really nervous coming into that because I knew that some of the aspects of the experience, which have been designed for an intact team 
were not part of, you know, that, that community. Oh, interesting. Well, it was fun. You wouldn't have known it. So there you go. Well, thank goodness. (laughs) Uh, Something people would be surprised to know about you. Um, I am deathly afraid of sharks. And as a result, my time spent in salt water, uh, is kept to a bare minimum and usually only up to my ankles. Wow. Yeah. You know, what's so funny is I think last night my son and husband were watching Jaws or something like that, which I won't watch. So that's just, <laughs> or the, that is the, I don't that know is the movie, was. that movie ruined me, completely <laughs> ruined me. Dana. Okay. God, I am convinced that they can smell my fear and I'm going to be lunch. It's terrible. It's so terrible. It's well, at least it's an avoidable like thing. It it totally is avoidable. And it's something I, I am, I, I have, I have attempted to conquer, well, conquer is the wrong word. I've attempted to work on it. So I've done some snorkeling in the open ocean on occasion. So I've, I've made some strides, but woo, you want to talk about an elevated heart rate, stick me in, a, in, in, in the ocean and you will see one petrified uh, middle-aged dude. You'll come out of there uh, in the fetal position, sucking your thumb. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yes. Back and forth. yes. Oh, all right. So, you know, it was, I was thinking about this next one. You, you could maybe steal and add a fifth one to it and have it be one of your five moment intros. So I call this the four C's. So this is a great icebreaker conversation starter. If money and reality were no object, yep. what car would you want to have? What country would you want to visit? What cuisine would you want to eat? And it has nothing, doesn't have to have anything to do with the country. And what celebrity living or dead would you want to eat that cuisine with? All right. So car, um, you know, from the time I was a kid, I always just really had an attraction to Ferraris. I don't know any of the models. I'm sure there's a variety of different ones, but there's just something to me. I, I've always just admired Ferraris. Okay. Con- country. Um, oh, where would I want to live? Um, or just visit. You don't have to. You don't have to live there. Just the country. Oh, you just to visit. visit. Yep. Uh, you know, I think I'd. I'd, I'd li- I'm. I'm interested in checking out Australia. Uh, I've never been there. I know it might not be the most exotic place, but I'd, I'd like I'd like to visit Australia. I'd like I to would visit, too. I'd like to visit Bali as well. Uh, yeah. I've heard great things. Um, there's actually a lot of places. That's a hard one for me. I'd like to go to Italy. I really love um, Italian food. I don't know if that's the cuisine though. Let me think about cuisine. What food would I want? I do love Italian food. Um, I love Greek food too. Um, oh, that's a hard one for me. I love Put him in a really, bucket and say Mediterranean. <laughs> you can't yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just I really love food. I don't know if I can narrow it down to just one. Good Lord. That's a hard one. How about you'll have uh, some Italian Greek buffet. Yeah, there you go. Um, and then celebrity, you know, for me, I would really love to sit down and, and, uh, break bread with Jerry Garcia. Mm. I would love to just chat with him about the stories and the life that he lived and explore, you know, the trappings of fame, uh, as well as just the exhilaration of being such an amazing artist and musician and that feeling of really connecting with an audience in a, in a shared experience of that kind of art. Um, I think it would be really, really cool. And to just for, for that, for the Grateful Dead to have done what they did, not abiding by the normal rules of the music industry and do it so far outside the mainstream for such a long time and to uh, have really created something uh, that has outlived the band. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I'd really love to sit down with him and, and grab some food. Good. Love it. Your favorite go-to movie? You know, I've got a few. Jaws is one of them, believe it or not. (laughs) I know, crazy. I love Shawshank Redemption. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Godfather series. So it'd be kind of, it'd be in there. It just depends what kind of mood I'm in. Um, And then if I'm looking to just be totally entertained, I am putting on Fletch. 
Oh, yes. Classic. Yeah. I love it. I love yeah. it. Your go-to song. Speaking uh, of the anthem experience. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's so hard because I've got so many songs in my head. Um, I, if I had to pick one, I am likely picking Fire on the Mountain by the Grateful Dead. There you go. That's Lovely. hard for me to choose just one, though. That's so hard. <laughs> Your signature dance move. <laughs> um, huh. uh, I don't know. I... I don't have one. I suck at dancing. I can't dance. I can't, I can't dance at all. I, I don't even know what you'd call what I do. I mean, the shark. No. Yeah. You know, for anyone that has watched Seinfeld, my dance moves are reminiscent of Elaine Bennis's uh, horrific uh, dance routine. Like I can't, I have no rhythm. It's terrible. I love it. We'll just call it the Elaine. There you go. That's yeah, we'll call it the too. Elaine. Yeah, that's exactly it. It looks like right. a dry heave is what I, yeah, that's my, that's my signature dance. The dry, the dry heave. Okay. The dry heave. Yeah. Fantastic. In another life, your job or career would be? Oh, for sure. A, a guitar player. No doubt. Nice. I said I'd be a DJ. Just nice. Clear. Nice. <sighs> What is something, and I say something lightly, it doesn't have to be a thing, but what's something you can't live without? Um, um, I mean, for me, it's my family. It's the, it's, it's my, my, <laughs> my daughters and my wife. Uh, if it's not people, I can't live without music. Yeah. You know, I said that I was like, please don't ever, like, if I lost my hearing ever, like completely, I would like, I, I don't know. I, like I die without music. Like I have to have music. And my husband yeah, sits I mean, like, huh? yeah, music is just so it's medicine for me. Yep. Yep. Something in your ordinary daily life that makes your heart happy. Making my bed every day. Have you I, read the book, make your bed? Yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I, uh, and I, it's so funny. Um, I don't let my wife make the bed cause she doesn't do it right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Uh, I will spend upwards of 10 minutes making the bed. Like I, I smooth all the creases out. I get the, 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 the comforter has to be even on both sides of the bed. It, it's, it's an OCD. It's a work of art. <laughs> it is. It, it, my bed, when I get into it at nighttime, it's like getting into a brand new bed and wow. I, just, I can't, I make my bed every day. I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and last but not least, what are you grateful for right now? I am, what am I grateful for right now? I'm grateful for being healthy. Uh, I am grateful for living in Phoenix this time of year. This is a great time of year to be in the Valley of the Sun because the weather's gorgeous outside. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful to, to have another day to just be here. Um, it's, uh, it's been a crazy, crazy year. And, and here we are connecting through Zoom, having a lovely conversation. And, you know, what a just appreciating that gift to, to have this as an opportunity. It's, you know, it's, yeah, life isn't so terrible for, for me. Uh, I feel pretty lucky. Well, Brian, one, I just so appreciate your just humanity and authenticity in our conversation. It was so fun. And I am so appreciative of the work that you do and really fostering human connection. And I'm super excited to see where um, Anthem goes. And I'll just do a plug. It was a fun experience for whether you're an intact team or not an intact team. I could imagine it'd be fun for even family gatherings or something. I mean, I just think there's a lot, a lot to it. And I'm looking forward to see the additional things you do to help people connect besides um, the music um, intro. And just thank you for, for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. It was great. Uh, always, always a pleasure to connect with you. And thanks for the work you were doing. And I wish you and your loved ones an unbelievable end to 2020 and a, and a great 2021. Thank you so much for listening to Show Up as a Leader. If you haven't yet subscribed, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. I'm Rosie Ward, and you can find me online at drrosieward.com, where you'll be able to sign up for my newsletter, check out the books I'm reading, and hear from the people I'm talking to. You can also get more information on what I'm up to professionally, including my coaching and speaking services. 
You can also find me on LinkedIn at R Ward, Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Rosie Ward, or email me at rosie at drrosieward.com. And I just want to remind you to remember that you have the choice every day to show up as a leader. So choose courage over comfort, embrace your humanity, and never, ever dull your sparkle. Take care, everyone.